Last week, the seventh round of talks began in Vienna. Over the weekend, the various parties went home for consultations and now they've returned. This has been the second week of negotiations for Iran to try and get the U.S. back into the deal that Donald Trump tore up in 2018 and to end the maximum pressure campaign that Biden has continued in his place. As I mentioned last time, Vienna is packed with luxury hotels, very fancy hotels, and every participant in these talks is staying at a different one. I'm standing in front of the Intercontinental, where the Iranian delegation is staying. Meanwhile, the talks are taking place just over there at the Palais Kabul. Now, last week, I spoke with Professor Merendi, who's advising the Iranian delegation. This week, I sat down with Dr. Baghdadi, Iran's chief negotiator. He's tasked with representing Iran at these talks and forging the best possible outcome for Iran's interests. That means getting the United States to respect the deal they signed together in 2015 and to lift all sanctions. I asked him how the talks were progressing about Iran's recent draft proposals, threats and intimidation by Israel, and whether Iran could trust the Americans not to break the deal again if they actually go back in. I'm Richard Medhurst, and you're watching The Communique. Dr. Baghdadi, uh, first of all, welcome to Vienna, and thank you for taking the time to sit down and do this interview with me and Press TV. Um, the first question I wanted to ask you is, you have now resumed the seventh round of nuclear negotiations, uh, talks to, to get sanctions lifted. Um, this is the first time you're leading this delegation under the new Raisi government. What are you doing differently compared to your predecessors who were here five months ago. بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم اون چیزی که ما روش تاکید داریم در این گفت what we are emphasizing in, in, in this round of negotiations and what has been already emphasized by the president of the Islamic Republic of Iran and other senior officials is that in the Vienna talks our main priority is to remove the illegal and cruel sanctions which have been imposed and reinstated against the Iranian nation during the past several years. The sanctions imposed and reimposed by the United States against the Iranian nation are in violation of the international law and regulations as well as principles and an international agreement called the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action as well as the provisions of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2231. In addition to Iran, other members of the Group 4 Plus 1 and even the new U.S. administration, they all agree and confess that the previous administration of the United States um, did a wrongdoing in pulling out of the JCPOA. And for this reason, the new administration, the Biden administration, wants to return from that mistake and they want to return to the 2015 agreement. And uh, speaking of these unilateral sanctions that have been imposed by the United States, um, you've submitted two draft proposals just last week, one on, on sanctions removal and the other one on Iran's uh, nuclear commitments. Uh, has there been any progress with these draft proposals and uh, when can we expect to see a third? What would be in the third? During six rounds of negotiations in Vienna in the past, ultimately the two sides um, drafted uh, some texts, several texts. Two of them were about the removal of sanctions and Iran's nuclear commitment. There was presidential elections in Iran. There was a new government in power. There was a new approach, new priorities in various areas, including the foreign policy. And it was normal that the new government, the new administration, uh, would have some observations and modifications with regard to the text drafted on the 20th of June this year. And on the basis of this, the Iranian side incorporated its observations and modifications on the sanctions removal and on the nuclear commitments into the draft documents concluded in 20th of June 2021. In one of the drafts of the 20th of June, 
which was on the nuclear commitments of Iran, there were numerous differences between the two parties. And the draft text of nuclear commitments included and contained a lot of brackets which indicated differences in approach between the two parties. The modifications um, formulated by the new Iranian team on the text on nuclear commitments were much less than the differences and issues of differences which existed in the original 20th of June document. And since the beginning of the new negotiations, as of uh, 29th of November, various sessions and working groups were held at the experts level and senior political directors level in order to discuss uh, both the drafts. And during the past days, there have been a lot of sessions of the working group on nuclear commitments in order to identify the differences in the draft text on nuclear uh, commitments within the framework, within a specific framework, and in order to restrict and limit the number of differences. And on, on such a basis, uh, there is a still ongoing negotiations between the two sides in order to finalize the issue of differences between the two sides so that we enter into negotiations to remove those differences. And very good progress has been made as with the uh, meetings which had been taking place since several days ago. The Russian ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations in Vienna is Mikhail Yulianov. He's also taking part in the Vienna talks. I interviewed him just a few months ago. Now, just earlier, he posted on Twitter that journalists were misinterpreting his comments and twisting his words. He said that, quote, many diplomats don't like to give interviews in order to be on the safe side. Probably they're right. This evening, I was in a rush, but provided comments to journalists at their request. I was misinterpreted. Be aware that I assess positively, not negatively, the position of Iran. In another tweet, he said that, to my surprise, some analysts and journalists describe the situation at the Vienna talks as dramatic, almost deadlock. This is not the case in point. He also described the atmosphere of the talks as positive. Last week, when I interviewed Professor Marendi, who's advising the Iranian delegation, we spoke at length about how inundated the media is with propaganda, orientalist rhetoric, and spin doctors trying to derail the talks, portraying Iran as uncooperative or non-compliant, dragging its feet. Now, while speaking to Dr. Baghdi, I asked him as well about recent reports in the media from anonymous U.S. officials who had made negative comments about the talks. He told me that what we're dealing with are two completely different realities, that what is said outside in the Western press and what's actually happening at the negotiating table are two completely different things. He said the same parties who attacked Iran's nuclear facilities, meaning Israel, were trying to derail the talks and poison the constructive atmosphere that they've reached in the negotiating room. In terms of uh, what was drafted in June and what's uh, being drafted now, uh, there are American officials, anonymous um, officials, talking to the press who say that uh, Iran has basically pocketed all the uh, beneficial concessions, the, the things that are good for Iran, and dropped all the other things, and uh, that Iran is buying time, trying to, to waste time with the negotiations. I mean, uh, it, this doesn't reflect what you just told me, where there's progress being made. Uh, what, where, do the, where do these opinions come from? What are they based on uh, in the Western press? We are presently facing two atmospheres, two places. One atmosphere or space is inside the negotiating room and one is outside. Inside the negotiating room, there are specific parties that are negotiating and they are already clear. But outside the negotiating room, it is not clear which identities are operating and what are they doing. The same escalatory identities that targeted Iran's nuclear facilities in, in terrorist operations and terrorist attacks, the same escalatory identities are trying to seriously provide obstacles and create obstacles on the progress of nuclear negotiation. And in addition of trying to poison the atmosphere outside the negotiating room, they are hoping that they would be able to provide a, a, a disconstructive or non-constructive atmosphere also inside the room. The way most people think of the Vienna talks, they think of the following parties being involved. 
Iran, China, Russia, the US, UK, France, Germany, and the EU. But there is an additional entity involved, an outside actor affecting the negotiations and placing its thumb on the scale. And that is undeniably Israel. It is no secret that Israel isn't a fan of the nuclear deal. It has been opposing the JCPOA from the very beginning. Whenever there have been negotiations, Israel has gone to the US and attempted to derail the talks by speaking with US officials and asking them to quit. And of course, we've gone over the numerous acts of assassination and sabotage that Israel has carried out against Iran over the years. Now, just in the last days, while talks are happening here in Vienna, the head of the Israeli occupation forces, Benny Gantz, is said to have drawn up plans for a military strike against Iran, that he had informed the Americans of this. I wanted to know how Israel's past aggressions and transgressions against Iran and these new threats that have surfaced during the recent days factored into the negotiations. Uh, speaking of these uh, uh, provocateurs, uh, people who are trying to escalate the situation, uh, Israel, in the last years, they've killed Iranian nuclear scientists. Uh, they've committed acts of uh, cyber, uh, cyber attacks, uh, acts of nuclear terrorism, sabotage in nuclear facilities. Um, how is that factored into the talks? Do the, does this even come up during the talks? Uh, because the United States has participated with Israel on these attacks. And um, what's your reaction to uh, the statements coming out in the last days that, that, that Israel is basically preparing a, a plan B or some kind of backup plan, uh, which would include military action in case the talks in Vienna uh, don't work out? It is already crystal clear that Zionists are trying very serious, seriously in order to uh, have a negative, a non-constructive and destructive atmosphere inside the negotiating room. They are pursuing the same destructive measures, as I mentioned, outside the negotiating room. And for this reason, the Zionist regime authorities are trying to spread the role of such a destructive role to the players which may have an influence inside the negotiating room. And some of these players are uh, having some sort of contradictory behavior. On one hand, they are saying that we are negotiating in order to resurrect the deal and the United States returns to the deal. And on the other hand, they are uh, either authoring and writing joint uh, press opinions and articles and participate in long hour meetings with that illegitimate entity in order to destroy the negotiations or create serious obstacles on the way of progress of negotiations. And any impediment or obstacle on the way of the progress of negotiations should be blamed on the players which provide the Zionist regime with the chance, with the opportunity, with the capacity and possibility to conduct destructive and non-constructive measures on the progress of negotiations. Uh, uh, Dr. Bagheri, you, you mentioned this kind of uh, contradictory behavior. Uh, something that stands out is in the last week, the United States has imposed more sanctions on Iran, while there are talks ongoing to lift sanctions on Iran. Um, the Biden administration said it would rejoin the JCPOA. Biden's been president for almost a year. That's still not happened. And he's kept the uh, maximum pressure campaign that Trump put in place. Uh, again, how do you reconcile these uh, contradictory positions coming from the Americans? We also believe that this is a contradictory and double-sided behavior by the U.S. government. And we believe that this is the U.S. administration which should explain about such contradictions in, in, in their behavior. Uh, the the follow-up that I wanted to ask you is that um, in terms of sanctions removal, the United States, they have various labels, right? So now they have nuclear-related sanctions, non-nuclear-related sanctions. Um, is their position still that they're only going to lift the nuclear-related sanctions uh, and everything else stays? Still on the issue of sanctions and removal of sanctions, the process of serious and real negotiations have not yet started. Of course, several drafts have been exchanged between the two sides. But what is clear and what is significant is that from our point of view, any sanction which is in contradiction and inconsistent with the JCPOA and the nuclear deal should be removed immediately. Either these sanctions have been uh, imposed during Obama or Trump 
or Biden administrations. All of them should be removed. The same case applies with all the sanctions which are somehow related to the JCPOA and they also need to be lifted. And on, on the same basis, all the sanctions with, which have been imposed under the so-called maximum pressure campaign by the U.S. administration, they need to be removed because they are related to the JCPOA. Over the weekend, Robert Malley, who's heading the negotiations on the U.S. side, gave an interview to Al Jazeera. He said that because Iran's nuclear program is so advanced that, quote, time was running out. As I've said before, this is a technological clock. It's not a chronological clock. In other words, if they slow down their nuclear program, we'd have more time. If they continue at the current pace, then time is running out. Secretary Blinken has made that clear over and over again. Time is running out. And we and the Europeans will have to conclude, if, if Iran continues on down this path, that they have killed the JCPOA and the JCPOA would be no more. Germany's new foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, gave a similar comment. Speaking at the G7 in England, she said that, quote, we do not have any progress. Due to the offer of the Iranian government, negotiations have been thrown back six months. She also added that time was running out. Now, the consensus among Western countries is that time is running out and Iran needs to do the right thing and come back into compliance. When I spoke last week with Professor Merendi, he told me that it's time for the Americans and Europeans to grasp that time is not on their side. Despite the discomfort, Iran has learned to live with sanctions to manage the maximum pressure campaign against it. And it has more leverage now with its nuclear program than ever before. As I said, the maximum pressure campaign, despite the hardship, but the economy has sort of, you know, has, has it's adjusted. And Iran is increasingly looking to live with sanctions rather than live in hope of the removal of sanctions. So that I think gradually the sanctions regime will become increasingly less uh, influential. I asked Dr. Baghri what he thought about Robert Malley's comments and how Iran would potentially scale back its program if, say, the U.S. rejoined the accord tomorrow. He told me that Iran was doing nothing covert, that the program is completely remedial and operating fully within the framework of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the Safeguards Agreement. He added that once the Americans lift their sanctions, Iran has no problem reversing the remedial measures that it has taken. Uh, the, the argument from the West, from, from the Americans, is that uh, Iran is uh, moving too quickly with its uh, nuclear program. I believe Robert Malley, who's leading, uh, who's a special envoy of the U.S. to Iran, he said that uh, this is not a chronological problem, it's a technological uh, uh, clock that's in place that, that basically Iran needs to slow down its nuclear program. Um, I mean, uh, how do you plan on, let's say, for example, tomorrow morning the JCPOA is back in place with the Americans, they return. Uh, how would Iran basically scale back its, um, nu its uh, nuclear program and, and uh, get back to where it was before? And, uh, I mean, what is your response to this idea that Iran is breaching the, the agreement, uh, even though Iran is still in the JCPOA? All the nuclear activities of Iran are being undertaken within the framework of the NPT and the Safeguards Agreement. And all the nuclear activities of Iran comprehensively are being inspected by the IAEA authorities. Iran does not have any secret nuclear activities. And the nuclear activities Iran are, is taking at the moment is exactly uh, compatible with the JCPOA because paragraphs 26 and 36 of the JCPOA entitles Iran in order to wholly or part partially um, suspend its activities if the other party fails to fulfill its commitments. We have announced earlier and we reiterated that our reactions are remedial and we started our nuclear activities one year after the United States pulled out of the nuclear agreement. When the Americans remove the illegal sanctions against Iran, grounds will be paved for Iran to stop its remedial activities. When Trump quit the JCPOA in 2018, he reimposed sanctions on Iran, targeting its oil and banking sectors, which have taken a heavy toll on Iran's economy and standard of living. 
Iran has over 1,500 U.S. sanctions on it, more than all other countries combined. One of the Iranians' main concerns right now at the negotiations is trusting that the Americans will actually stay in the deal and abide by it if they rejoin. Iran wants a comprehensive verification method for sanctions relief, a guarantee that whoever succeeds Biden in the Oval Office won't just tear up the accord again and target Iran with what is essentially siege warfare. In 2010, Iran ranked sixth globally in attracting foreign direct investments. When the nuclear deal was reached, many Western and international firms invested billions in Iran only to see their investments go down the drain when the U.S. left the deal in 2018 and placed sanctions again on the Islamic Republic, making it impossible to interact with Iran without fear of reprisal. You can see here in 2015 how foreign investment in Iran was climbing and then suddenly a sharp decline in 2019 with the departure of the U.S. and re-imposition of sanctions the year before. You can understand the reluctance of foreign firms to go through such a debacle again, given the uncertainty of the Americans and their actions, not to mention how it affects Iranians themselves and their well-being. I asked Dr. Bagheri why he should trust the United States this time and how he plans on making sure the Americans hold up their end of the deal if they come back to it at all. So, uh, uh, Dr. Bagheri, uh, the JCPOA, um, it, it has a mechanism to verify with the IAEA that Iran complies with the agreement, with the accord. Um, what's the mechanism to verify that the Americans will comply with uh, whatever agreement is reached, if it's just returning back to the, to the simple JCPOA, uh, how, how will Iran be able to verify that the Americans are actually lifting the sanctions? How can you make sure that uh, the next American administration in 2025 is not just going to come in and quit the JCPOA again and put sanctions on Iran again? There are very differences of opinions and different issues in the draft text provided in the 20th of June. The issues of the issues you referred to, the issue of guarantees and the issue of verification, are one of the one of those differences which have not yet been resolved, and they should be resolved in the course of negotiations in order to conclude a mutually agreed deal. So, uh, just as a last question, uh, what is the biggest obstacle uh, for the JCPOA to be re-implemented in full by everybody? I believe that if the other party is enjoying a serious determination and practical preparedness in order to fulfill all its obligations within the framework of the JCPOA without any exception, then it, I truly believe that within a short span of time, we would be able to reach a mutually agreed deal. Dr. Baghari, thank you so much for your time and for sitting down with us for this interview. I really appreciate it. I would also to thank you and your viewers. Thank you. What's clear in covering these talks is that there's a lot of back and forth, a huge blame game being played. The Americans and Europeans want Iran to scale back its nuclear program before they do anything. But Iran is also unequivocal and wants the Americans to get back in the deal first. Dr. Bagri, Iran's chief negotiator, told me that everything Iran is doing is within the framework of the NPT, the Safeguards Agreement, and the JCPOA. When I spoke to him earlier, he invoked Article 26 and 36 of the JCPOA. What is absolutely crystal clear and indisputable is one thing. The JCPOA does say in these two articles that if there is significant non-performance and re-imposition of sanctions, Iran will treat this as grounds to cease performing its commitments under the JCPOA in whole or in part. That's not an opinion, it's a fact. That's what it says in the JCPOA. It's crystal clear. Now, once again, this is something we've repeated a thousand times, but it's true. Iran's remedial measures, whether that's increasing the cascades, its number of centrifuges, or enriching uranium past 3.67%, these are things that are all part of the deal. So the Americans may not like it, the Europeans may not like it, and the Western press may lie about it. But Iran has, in fact, stuck to the deal the entire way through even when scaling up its nuclear program, because it has the right to do so after the Americans left. Iran never left the deal. So if the Americans and Europeans want Iran to scale back its nuclear program, the U.S. is going to have to re-enter the nuclear accord first. The only reason the other parties are at the negotiating table with Iran in the first place is precisely because Iran has leverage, and they're not giving that up. Why should they, when they're allowed to have it under the JCPOA? Dr. Bagri was unequivocal. The ball is now in the Americans' court. Coming to you directly from Vienna, thanks for tuning in. 
I'm Richard Medhurst, and this is The Communique.